Well, good evening. It's good to see everyone this evening. Hope you had a good afternoon. This evening, uh, our theme is going to be how we can praise and rejoice in the Lord because He is always good. And a God who is always good is certainly worthy of our praise. And so page 39, let's stand together. Praise Him, praise Him. Page 39, praise Him, praise Him. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing on earth His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor, give to His holy name. I the shepherd, Jesus the Christ. together. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Good singing tonight. Well, glad you could be with us. And uh, we got a fun night tonight. Of course, we have Pastor Holman back with us. Did an excellent job this morning. He's back again with us tonight. And then we have another friend with us, Jonathan Washer, and uh, his ministry, Inside the Lines. He's going to tell us some about that, see if that may be a good for, fit with us and, and his ministry going forward. And appreciate him being here with us. Uh, so it should be a, a good night. We're looking forward to it. Uh, but to get started, John, would you mind opening us in a word of prayer? Amen. You may be seated while the choir sings.
We'll continue singing this evening, looking at the goodness of God. And God is worthy of our praise, even when we don't understand, even when times don't seem good. God is always good. Let's stand together and sing page 680, Rejoice in the Lord. Let's stand together, 680, Rejoice in the Lord. That chorus one more time, oh rejoice in the Lord. Oh rejoice in the I enjoy that song. Is that anybody else's favorite? I, I love that song. Maybe as you come forward, we'll take the night's tithe and offering. And uh, let's remember our church family in prayer. Let's remember, uh, I was thinking about Royce today. I know he's coming back from his knee surgery. Pray that he gets feeling better. Of course, Rex and uh, his son, Donnie. And uh, just a lot of folks right now that are recovering. Let's keep them in prayer. Uh, Caleb, would you mind praying for us tonight? Amen. You may be seated. I mentioned at the beginning of the service that we have Jonathan Washer with us, 
And uh, I had heard about his ministry before I met him, and uh, he's done the same ministry over at Anderson. I think they partnered together to do uh, the Pendleton Prison and uh, took a basketball tournament over there and uh, shared the gospel with the guys over there. And so when he contacted us a couple months ago, uh, I was already a little bit familiar with him. And then yesterday, our, our paths crossed over at the teen rally. It just so happened to, to see each other there. So I uh, enjoyed getting to meet him so far and excited to hear what his ministry is. He, uh, I tell you, if you're going to do a basketball ministry, Newcastle is the place, is it not? So, uh, so I, I thought that may be something for us to think about, pray about. So Jonathan, if you would, please come and just kind of tell us about your ministry and, and update where you are right now. I want to say thank you to Pastor Brian, first of all, for allowing me to, to come and, and talk about our ministry. I do have a family. I have a wife and three boys, and they're parked over in our RV over at Southeast Baptist Tabernacle, uh, southern Indianapolis. So uh, we are from South Carolina, and in 2014, uh, the Lord allowed us to start a ministry called Inside the Lines. Uh, we were able to get into prison right here or nearby in Illinois and uh, do a uh, tournament, use sports to preach the gospel to about 50 men there in Illinois. And uh, what you don't understand sitting right here, perhaps, is that in prison, sports are a huge deal. It's a big deal in prison. Now, whether we agree with that or not, it's still going to go on. It's still going to take place. And uh, so we were able to do that in 2014. And since starting that in 2014 as a family, we've been to about seven or eight states. And uh, we've done these tournaments. Um, we, I've been in and out of prison about 100 times. I, I know it sounds like a, I'm a hardened criminal. I like telling people that, especially people out in the street that I don't know about. Uh, that's what I do as a job. And uh, But every time we're in there, uh, we set up basketball tournaments for the men, for the inmates to play each other. And uh, we'll have, I would have, I average probably around 65, 70 guys that will come to participate in that. We've had 100 guys in a gym with two full courts and like a, a place to work out. And so it with maybe one or two officers, so that's a little nervous. But uh, um, it's a big deal in, in prison. Now, we also do ladies. We'll do ladies volleyball tournaments. Now. There's not a ladies uh, institution around here that I know of, um, but uh, whenever we go into an institution, we try to get independent Baptist churches to send some volunteers in to help us. So how many of you have ever been to prison? Raise your hand. Careful how you answer that question, okay? Because we're looking around now and figuring out who's been in prison, all right? Uh, no, if you've never been in, this is a great opportunity to come. Uh, just like we partner with Grace Baptist over in Anderson, what we do is uh, we try to figure out a good date for them that works, and uh, it works for the prison, and then they get some men to volunteer to come in. Um, you, all you just got to pass a background check. I believe in Indiana, that's all you have to do. And so you come on the day of the tournament. You don't have to play basketball. So if you are 18 up to 108, all right, you can come in and uh, participate with us. We need men to counsel uh, the inmates. Sometimes I just send the men to just go sit with them and go listen to them and uh, just be a, a Christ to them, uh, to hear them and to try to give them the truth of the Word of God. And so that's one way you can be involved. Lord willing, when COVID and all this has passed and all that's done and we're able to get back into prisons, we would love to get back in, to get into Newcastle Correctional Center. We've never been in there. And uh, your church is right here, uh, ready to go. And uh, so you guys can send them some men in uh, with us. We're going there into the prison, especially if you've never been. We'd love to take you in. And uh, to show you, really, what we're just showing you is a whole other mission field. That's what it is uh, of people that are ready uh, to trust the Lord for salvation because it's not hard to convince them they need Jesus. And, uh, and so you can come and join us. The second thing you can do, especially for you ladies right now that are feeling left out because you're not going to be coming in with us to the men's institution, I have a stack of cards right here. I'll, I'll be holding them uh, on the way out tonight. If you grab a card on the back of the card, it has a website, all right, itlassist.org. And uh, you ladies and men can be involved in writing to the inmates. Again, you probably say, you want me to write to the, are you sure about that? No, okay. You can write to the inmates. We have a system going with our ministry to where uh, we'll give you ladies a lady to write, a lady inmate to write. You men will give you a man to write. And uh, what you'll do is you'll just type out your letter on our website. It tells you exactly what you can say the first time to kind of break the ice. And uh, so then we'll take your letter and then we'll give it to the inmate. Now, a lot of prisons have emails, email system, and so that inmate will write us back by way of email, and it comes to our email account, and then we forward it to you, okay? We never give them your real name. We give them an alias name. We don't give them your address. We don't give them your church. We don't give them your social security number, okay? We don't give them any of that stuff. 
you are just being used by God to help disciple these inmates, to give them encouragement from the Word of God. I have uh, people that have told me that basically what they do is they do their own devotions, and then they write a letter every couple of weeks, maybe once a month, whatever. It's not a requirement to do a certain amount of time. And just tell the inmates what you've been learning in your own time with the Lord. And uh, so they just love getting any kind of letters, but then you're able to take the Word of God and put in that letter. That would be a great encouragement. So on the way out, pick up one of these cards, and you can find out more about our ministry in general. Uh, but you men, be prepared next time. Uh, we're, we always come uh, to the Midwest around the fall. And so if we can set up a tournament, then we'd love to have you come in with us. And then both ladies and gentlemen here, you guys can grab one of these cards, look at our website, and begin to write to the inmates. All right, thank you so much again. Thank you so much for that. Well, we've had Pastor Holman with us all day today, and uh, just been an uh, uh, encouragement, hasn't he? That message this morning, uh, I know many of you have mentioned that's just what you needed in your life this morning, and uh, Pastor Holman, appreciate you coming, and we'll turn it over to you again, and uh, share what the Lord has for us. Well, thank you, and uh, open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Acts, chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Uh, I have enjoyed this day, and thank you for your hospitality. 
and uh, thank you for how you've ministered to my wife and I as well. Uh, I uh, pastored Hillcrest Baptist Church in Richmond, Indiana, a church I grew up in. Uh, I actually was 13 when my dad started Hillcrest Baptist Church, and uh, I came back in uh, December of 99 and spent my last 20 years there uh, pastoring Hillcrest. Uh, I decided to take a page out of uh, Stan's book and retire. And uh, I thought, I can't afford to retire. I was one of those dumb preachers that opted out of Social Security. So I retired knowing I had, I had no promise of income. And, uh, but I did feel like that's what the Lord wanted me to do. And uh, in 2002, we started there in Richmond what's called Shepherd's Way, which was a recovery home for men. Now, I've never been an addict. In fact, honestly, I've never had a sip of alcohol. One of the guys I was talking to the other day said, man, you're kidding me. You've never tasted alcohol? I said, I've never tasted alcohol. He said, you ever smoked a cigarette? I said, I've never smoked a cigarette. He said, you got to be kidding me. I said, no, I've never done any of that. I'm just a sinner that needed Jesus. But I never did any of that. But somehow, that crowd always followed me around. <laughs> I thought, instead of them coming to my home, I'm going to start a place for them. So we started Shepherd's Way, another couple of myself, and man, that took off, and God bless that we have two deacons in our church today that came out of that. Uh, there's a pastor in uh, Richmond that went to Liberty University uh, that came back to Richmond and started Surety Community Church, who came out of that program. Uh, one of the guys who's a deacon in our church, the first time I laid eyes on him, was he was strung out on something, and we went to see him in the hospital, and the guy that went with me, who helped me start Shepherd's Way, said, we're not taking him. He said, this, this guy will never make it. Well, I'm glad that guy wasn't God. Because not only did that guy make it, he is an incredible testimony for the power of the gospel today. And that's been where my heart has been. And in 2010, uh, we got a big facility out on 27 between Richmond and uh, Liberty, Indiana, given to us. And so we started what's called Crossroad Recovery Center for Women. It was a six-month program, but we were turning away, the need is so great, a girl a day. Think of that. Turning away a girl a day because we didn't have room for them. And we let them come. They don't pay us a penny. And my that's where my heart is. Uh, one of the things I've been doing since I retired, and uh, somebody here was telling me they're a funeral director. Uh, uh, I can't see them here, but oh, right there in the back. Funeral directors usually stay in the back. You know what I mean? <laughs> they they want to be out of... But anyway, I, I've been working about 17 to 20 hours a week uh, at the funeral home, and... Uh, um, the, uh, uh, he sent me to a conference in Indianapolis for funeral directors. Now, I, I don't, you know, I don't embalm people. I don't work with them that way. I just help out. But I got over there, and a young lady came up to me and threw her arms around my neck, and I thought, uh-oh, I don't know who this is. <laughs> and she recognized that, and she stepped back, and she said, you don't remember me, Pastor Holman, do you? I said, you are going to have to help me. I'm sorry. She said, seven years ago, I was homeless, strung out on you name it. And she said, somebody told me about Crossroad. And I came to Crossroad, and God delivered me and set me free. And, she said, and I said, what are you doing here? She said, I'm getting my funeral director's license. And that's where my heart lies. And so I retired and haven't regretted it. I knew God was in it for me. 
I can still walk into pulpits mm -hmm. and preach, but, but I said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life uh, making my life count in this area. And we, in, since 2010, we've had 685 women go through our program. Uh, 290 of them have graduated. That represented, that represented 1,370 some kids. And I got to tell you, this problem is not going away. And not only is this not problem not going away, but this problem is becoming a second and third generation problem. And we can bury our head in the sands if we choose to, but I'm going to tell you something. This world desperately needs the Lord. Uh, Jonathan, I appreciate so very much what you're doing. That is an incredible tool that God can use to reach people who need Jesus. And I applaud you for it and thank you for it. And uh, I took your card tonight. I'll do everything that I can do to help promote what you're doing because I think God... God can use that. So that's, that's what I'm doing, and I've been preaching. Uh, you know, I told you my COVID story this morning. The one thing that hasn't bounced back is my voice. Uh, I, I have one of those strong voices. But ever since COVID, I had that ventilator stuck down my throat for 39 days. But he told me it's because my lungs need to completely heal. And he said, it's going to take a year for your lungs to heal properly. And he told me that in February. And I said, yeah, but you told me I could start preaching because I'd started preaching, preached somewhere every Sunday. He said, you told me you were retired. He said, I didn't know you were going to be preaching somewhere every Sunday. So he made me stop preaching for a couple of months. But I have never had anybody ever tell me they couldn't hear me. But since I've been preaching, a lot of people say, you're too soft. You're too soft. You know, when I first took my, when I took my first church in 1974, there was a guy in that church by the name of John Webb. He was an incredible guy. And he, he picked up that I had a strong voice. He said, now, Pastor, he says, I'm going to help you. He says, if you get too, too loud, he says, I'm going to go like this. <laughs> Look back there. If he's going like this, I needed a quiet. He said, if you get too soft, I'm going to go like this. So I looked back there, and you know what he's doing? I thought, I better stop right now. <laughs> Did you hear about the guy that, that resigned his church? And the church said, we are never, ever going to get another pastor that preaches two hours. He preached two hours. Son, you lose people going that long. I don't care how good you are. So they said, we're never going to get another guy that preaches two hours. So there was a traveling evangelist in the area, and they invited him to fill the pulpit, and he preached for 20 minutes. They liked that. So they invited him to come back in lieu of a call. So he came back in lieu of a call, and he preached for 35 minutes. Now, they thought that's going in the wrong direction, but that's better than, than two hours. So they invited him back to candidate. When he came back to candidate, lo and behold, he preached for two hours. Oh, they were upset. And when they got him back to interview him, one of the men stood and said, Now, wait a minute. The first time you preached, you preached 20 minutes. The second time you preached, you preached 35 minutes. This time, today, when you're candidated, you preach for two hours. What's the difference? He said, well, ladies and gentlemen, he said, the first time I preached, I just had my teeth cut out. He said, I couldn't go any longer. He said, the second time I preached, I just got my new teeth. That's all I could go. He said, today I got up and by accident, I got my wife's teeth. <laughs> Tom Allen told me that one if you want to blame somebody. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. Well, I want you to turn. <laughs> wow. Could somebody give me a ride home tonight? My wife not, may not let me ride with her. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 is the story of Paul's conversion. It's his testimony. You know what I encourage people to do? I encourage people to write out their testimony. If you're going to share it with someone, write it out. 
Put your testimony down on paper. We uh, help the folks that go through our drug, pro dr drug program to, to do their testimony. And, you know, all of them say the same thing. Oh, we, we don't know scripture. I said, you don't need to know scripture. I said, here's what a testimony is. It's what you were before Christ. It's what Christ has done for you. And it's what you are now after Christ. That's a testimony. Write your testimony that you can be able to share it with other people. What Christ has done in your life. And let's read the first few verses. And we'll see this is Paul's testimony. Here's Saul. His name was changed. Yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. And he went in to the high priest and desired of him letters to go to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of the way. Christians in that day were called the way. Boy, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. You know, the first mention of Saul in the Bible is in Acts chapter 7. And in Acts chapter 7, he's standing and holding the coats of those wicked men that are stoning Stephen, and he is listening as those words of Stephen keep ringing in his ears. Father, lay not their, this sin to their charge. I think that's one of the things he couldn't get out of his mind. Do you know that people might not pay any attention to what you say, but they can't argue about the change in your life. They can't argue the fact that God has, has saved you and, and brought some, made you different. And he couldn't get that scene out of his mind. And he stood there watching as those rocks caromed off the bloody and bruised body of that preacher Stephen. And he watched as they stoned Stephen to death. The next time we find his name is here in Acts chapter 9, when he's making his way along the dusty roads there in the Middle East, carrying in his hands the death warrants of thousands of Christians, when suddenly the light from heaven opens up and brings him to his knees. And he lifts his head heavenward, and he says, now watch this. Who art thou, Lord? But literally, who art thou, sir? It's a different word from the second time that word is used. You know why? Because he didn't yet know Jesus. You really can't know Jesus until you recognize that he's the Lord. And that voice from heaven said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Why do you kick against the pricks? That, that conviction that went all the way back that he couldn't shed, that he couldn't get rid of. I'm that Jesus whom thou persecutest, whom you're persecuting. And then watch this. Now he says, Literally, literally, a different word in the Greek. Lord, what will thou have me to do? And there on the Damascus road that day, he found Jesus. Can you go back to that place where you found Jesus? Can you go back to that time where you invited Christ into your life? Can you go back to that moment and say, there's the place I was when I found Jesus. And it was there on that Damascus road that day that Paul, by faith, trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. 
And that's where God began to work in his life. And when you go down through here, beginning with verse 17, you'll find the things that changed in his life. And that's what I want to give you. After conversion, what? What should I begin to do? What should I continue to do? Notice verse 17. It says the last part of the verse, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Boy, I got to tell you, folks, we need God's Spirit in us. You know what I am afraid we are doing today, including the churches I've pastored? We're simply trying to put together programs without the work of the Holy Spirit going on. You know, I spent about seven years traveling. Got to travel all over the world. And one of the places that I was was Zimbabwe. And in Zimbabwe, there is a type of monkey that mimics everything they see. They watch humans and they mimic what they see. One day we broke camp. We were out in the bush. One day we broke camp and we left. And we came back into camp late at night, and there those monkeys were. They had seated themselves on those wood seats that we had made in a circle around a bonfire. There was no fire because we had left camp early in the morning. But you know what they were doing? They were warming their hands because they had seen us do it. If we're not careful... We watch what other people are doing, but we get nothing from God ourselves. And we're, mi we're merely mimicking what we see others do instead of depending on the precious Holy Spirit of God for the power we need to do his work. There was a group of people from Saudi Arabia came to the United States, New York City, years ago. You know what fascinated them more than anything else? is that they could, in their hotel rooms, turn on a faucet and out would come water. They would turn that thing on and just watch in amazement. You know what the hotel proprietor discovered when they left? All his faucets were missing. They had taken the faucets back to Saudi Arabia thinking that all they had to do was turn them on and out would come water. Isn't that a lot of times how we attempt to do ministry? Without God's blessing, without God's power. Suppose I took a white glove. And suppose I put the white glove on the piano. And suppose I said five fingers on that white glove. Suppose I said, uh, glove, play us a tune. Yeah, you know what you would do? Rex would get up, and he'd go get Tom Allen. And they'd get John. They'd come over here, get Brian, and say, what kind of nuts you bring into this place today? <laughs> the guy's putting a glove on white keys and telling that glove to play the piano. But you know what? What if one of these pianists would go over there and put their hand into that glove? That glove would simply respond to the fingers as they moved across those keys. And you know what we are to do if we're led by the Spirit? We're simply to respond to the Spirit of God as he works in our life. As he works in us to produce the things that God wants us to have in our life. You know what makes us spiritual? What makes us spiritual is not the gifts of the Spirit. What makes us spiritual is the fruit of the Spirit. That's why guys can get up and sing and ladies and people can get up and preach and people can do all kinds of spiritual things and have all kinds of skeletons in the closet. Because it's not the gifts of the Spirit that make us spiritual. It's the fruit of the Spirit. When you were a kid, this probably goes back a long way. You remember that thing called the fizzy? You know, there's a grape fizzy and a lime fizzy and... And uh, a strawberry fizzy, that was my favorite. And you'd drop it in the water, and it wasn't long until the water would become what the fizzy was. And boy, when I got saved, the Holy Spirit came into my life. 
And if I will let the Holy Spirit give me direction and lead me, it's not long until I'll become what the Holy Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. And so it says here that he was converted and then he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice verse 18. And immediately it fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forwith and arose and was baptized. You know, I think baptism is absolutely important in the life of a believer. If a person's saved, they ought to be baptized. Jesus set the example that was so important. Now, baptism has nothing to do with saving us. But on the other hand, if Jesus thought it important enough to be baptized, you and I, once we're saved, ought to be baptized. What is baptism? It's our coming out party. That's what it is. It identifies us with the Christian faith. I was in the northern part of the Philippines. And the northern part of the Philippines is where the Muslim activity is. And we had a meeting there, and there were two young men that were interested in the gospel. And, and we talked to them, and finally they both trusted Christ. They were both at the University of the Philippines, both studying to be attorneys. And one of them came to me and said, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get baptized. I said, well, number one, that's your decision. I don't want to put any pressure on you because you need to be led of the Lord. He said, well, do you want to know why? I said, well, you're free to tell me. He said, as you know, I'm out of a Muslim family. He said, the fact that we prayed that prayer, you worked us through, said my parents could care less about that. But he said, when we get baptized, that changes the whole scenario. He said, that identifies us with the Christian faith. He says, I'm telling you. He said, one night, he says, if I took that step, he said, my dad, under our law, would have every right to come in and take my head off with a machete. I said, well, then you need to make sure this is what you want. He said, all I can, gi I said, all I can give you is what Scripture says. You make the decision. You be willing to pay whatever price you feel like God wants you to pay. Paul followed the Lord in believers' baptism. You know why? Because God had done something in his heart. God had done something in his life. What is baptism picture? It pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we immerse. That's why we take people down into the water. Because what they, they are saying when they get baptized, someone in our Sunday school class today with Brother John, someone shared the fact and asked prayer for a lady that's in the hospital that just got baptized here last month. And when she went down into the water and they brought her back up, what she was saying to us is, I believe that Jesus died for me and he was buried for me. And thank God he rose again for me. The importance of baptism. Notice something else in verse 19. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples that were at Damascus. You know what that tells me? He joined himself to a group of believers. That's what church is. Why do we gather together? We gather together, folks, because you need me and I need you. And we need each other. That's what community is called. Well, we've, we've just about lost that in some cases today. The pandemic did a number on churches. We are told in the recent statistics that 36% of the people who left because of the pandemic will never come back. Now, I realize there's reasons for some people not to be out in a group. I understand that. If anybody should understand that, I should understand it. But on the other hand, I know couples that say to me, nah, we can just watch it online. Jammies and Jesus. Woo, woo, woo. I think to myself, where have we lost it? 
what we did this morning, what we did tonight, we need each other. We need the encouragement. We need the support. Do you know that in Scripture, 56 times it uses the phrase one another? Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Lift one another up. Community is so important. I spoke at a, uh, this was years and years ago, at a camp in Apache Creek, New Mexico. I mean, listen, I've been all over the world. You know what my idea of camping out is? My idea of camping out is Holiday Inn without maid service. That's my idea of camping out. But I was in Apache Creek, New Mexico, way out in the middle of nowhere, and A.C. Green, remember the old uh, Los Angeles Laker? And he bought this camp, and he bust in... Uh, all the street kids from El Paso and Albuquerque uh, for, the, for weeks at a time in the summer. And one summer I was asked to be the speaker. And right across from the Apache Creek camp, there, it, it's in a mountainous area. And uh, right across from the camp, there you can climb up to the top of the mountain. It's called Cherry Cross. And I walked across the street with all the campers, and they were excited about climbing that thing. And I thought, oh, son, I'm 49 years old. I'm never going to make it up this thing. And then one of the kids said, Preacher, you going to go with us? I said, I don't know. He said, you're chicken, aren't you? I said, let's go. And so we started climbing up that, that thing, and I got about half, and all those all them rest of them were on up, all the way to the top, and I was halfway up, and I thought, I am not going to make it. And I thought, they're going to have to bring in a helicopter to get me off this thing. <laughs> and if they don't bring in a helicopter, I'm in trouble, because I know this area is full of mountain lions, and one of them is going to eat me. <laughs> <laughs> I got him. <laughs> I have no idea what I did, but whatever I did, I hope it doesn't happen again. But three of you are now awake. Thank God you can listen to me. You got a wild crowd here, huh? I'll tell you. About that time they stuck their head, there must have been 150 of them. They stuck their head up over, they said, come on, preacher, you can do it. Come on, preacher, keep climbing. Come on, preacher, keep climbing. Come on, preacher, you can do it. And slowly but surely, I climbed that Cherry Cross mountain until I got to the top. Why? Because there were some folks there encouraging me to do it. And we need each other, folks. In this day and age, look around. Man, we, we're in trouble. I, I don't li ever like to be pessimistic because the scripture says where sin did abound grace did much more abound but you look around and see the city of Richmond Indiana a city of 29,000 people 80 out of every 500 people have OD'd now think about that 80 out of every 500 people. Now, not all of them died because they can use Narcon or, and bring them back to life. What I'm saying to you is in this turbulent world that we live, we need each other. And here, Saul got saved and they changed his name. You're given a new identity in Christ when you get saved. And he found himself a group of believers that could help him grow, that could help encourage him. Verse number 26, it says, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he is swayed to join himself to the disciples. He said, Man, it worked so good in Damascus. I got to go back to Jerusalem. I'm going to find me a group of believers there. But notice, but they were all afraid of him. See, we got to check our own selves when visitors come in the door. The guy that does our the guy that does our sound. First time he walked into Hillcrest, son, he was a mess. He was an absolute mess. 
And people, people, you could hear them, people. And I had no idea who he was. And after the service, he laid out on that back pew and he began to weep. And he began to cry. And one of our men went to him. And he told, laid his heart bare. His wife had left him. His life was going nowhere. He was consumed with addictions. By the way, isn't that the kind of people that Jesus died for? Because we're all sinners. Every one of us. We've been saved any length of time and get our life straightened out. If we're not careful, we tend to lose sight of those who haven't quite got there yet. Three weeks later, his wife came home and he brought her to church. And she tells this in her own testimony. I was preaching through the Ten Commandments and I was on the Seventh Commandment that Sunday, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And the title was How to Affair Proof Your Marriage. And she had left weeks before with another guy. And I didn't know this, but she accused Larry of telling her what, telling me what she had done. I had no idea. I got to tell you, God got a hold of their life, and God has changed their life. And you know what? He, by their own admission, they say, oh, I got to be in church. If I don't get help and support and encouragement from other believers... It won't be long. I'll be right back out there. And you and I got to make sure, hey, when they come in, that we don't turn a deaf ear to them. But Barnabas took him. There you go. You know what Barnabas means? It means son of encouragement. You know, I may not be able to sing. You heard a demonstration of that this morning. I may not be able to sing. I may not be able to do a lot of things. But you know what? I can be an encourager. I can encourage someone. So Barnabas, whose name means encouragement, went and got him and took him, took him to the apostles and said, Hey, here's Saul. He's been saved. And here's, I'm going to declare to you why I can tell you that. And when he got saved, he was spirit-filled and he was baptized and he joined himself to a group of believers. Verse 20, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. Let your light shine. Be a testimony to those around you. I've been working. My brother back there will, will agree to this. I've been working out. You know, I spent my entire life in ministry. This is the first time I've really worked out since college. And I can't believe what I hear. The language. I can't believe what I witness. But oh, what a mission field. Our brother here talked to us about what he's doing as being a mission field. Look at your neighborhood is a mission field. Where you work is a mission field. Where you shop is a mission field. Let other people see Christ in you. And it says he preached Christ. My dad, my mom was here this morning with my wife and I. My dad is 94. My dad has Alzheimer's. My dad has had an incredible ministry. Uh, some of you know my dad. He's preached here many times. In 2018, I wrote letters to folks that were saved at Hillcrest and pastoring all over the world. And on Easter Sunday, 2018, there were over 50,000 people in churches that my dad had had a hand in their salvation or in their mentoring. My dad has Alzheimer's. Last time I took him to the doctor, he asked me 20 times how, many, how long I had worked there. He, he, he can't put three words together. Three weeks ago, my mother on a Monday night was all excited. She called me. She said, Marty, I just got to tell you this. She's, my mom goes down it. She's in the same 
facility as my dad, but she's in assisted care. My dad is in uh, the Alzheimer's unit. And uh, she goes down at 6 o'clock every night to the Alzheimer's unit. They put them in a separate room. They eat dinner together. They watch gun smoke together. My dad worships over gun smoke and Bill Gaither tapes. And, uh, and then they, uh, then they uh, uh, watch uh, Wheel of Fortune together in Jeopardy. And after that was over, my mom took my dad out of the room. She said he hadn't had a good night, can't put three words together. And there was a lady sitting there who had just come into the Alzheimer's unit. Her head was in her hand, and it looked like she had the weight of the world. My dad looked up at my mom, and he said, Amy, take me over by that woman. My mom said I hesitated a little bit because I had no idea what he was going to say. She took him over by that woman. And my mom said to me, Marty, you're not going to believe this. But for the next 15 minutes, he was your dad of old. He shared the scripture and the gospel so clearly. He told her why she needed to be saved. He told her how to be saved. And then he pointed his finger at her and said, Ma'am, you need to trust Jesus as your personal savior. And she said, I think I'll do that. And mom said, Marty, you're not going to believe this. But he bowed his head with her, and he prayed and helped her pray the sinner's prayer. So clearly did he articulate it. And said when he was finished, the fog rolled back in, and the disease returned. What am I saying? I'm saying there's a guy who spent his entire life. He wasn't saved until he was 30. But when he got saved, he began to preach Christ. And I got to tell you something. If you'll just share Christ with others, let your line, light shine. You see, here's the problem. We think we got to do the work. You know what? I got some people out there that I've saved. They haven't lasted a week. <laughs> the work of evangelization belongs to you and me. The work of regeneration belongs to God. It's not my responsibility to save anybody. It's just my responsibility to share Christ. It's just your responsibility to preach Christ. Here's Paul. He got saved on the road to Damascus. And when he got saved, he got the Holy Spirit and he began to be led by the Spirit. And he got baptized and he joined himself to a group of believers and he began to preach Christ and look at verse 21 and all that heard him were amazed and said is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that attempt that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest what's that tell you why were they, why were they amazed they were amazed because his life changed. I got to tell you, if, you're, if someone's a professing Christian and there's no change in their life, God's the judge. When a person gets saved and God changes their life, other people watching will be amazed. They might not say it, but they will be amazed because there is a change. And then he goes on to say, verse 22, but Saul increased the more in strength. You know what that says? He just grew. Isn't it easy to just sort of get status quo and quit growing? You know why we need trials? You know why we need the troubles that life sends our way so we can respond to them in the right way and with God's help go through them and if we'll quietly listen God will help us grow I tell you I sit and talk to people and I think to myself come on God's trying to tell you something here listen to him don't let this defeat you 
Grow through it. Grow because of it. Because God wants to use you and me. And old Paul, he found Jesus on the road to Damascus, and his life became one of constant growth. Look at verse 23 through verse 25. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him, but their laying await was known as Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. You know what comes with it? I wish I didn't have to talk about this part, but what comes with it is persecution. All they that live godly must suffer persecution. Somehow, some way, we're going to be persecuted if we take a stand. I have a lady that I've known since she's been a girl, since a small girl. I saw her at the hospital one day. She said, Pastor Holman, she said, would you let me come to your church? I said, absolutely, Kelly. You can come to my church any time. She said, well, you know I'm a lesbian. I said, you said that. I didn't say that. But I said, you come any time. I said, you might be uncomfortable sometimes because of message, but you're welcomed and you're loved. Well, when the law was changed here in Indiana and made it legal for same-sex marriage, she called me. She said, Pastor Holman, she said, would you marry me? And the girl she was going to be married to was a captain in the Richmond Police Department. I said, Kelly, I can't do that. She said, and she said, why? I said, you know why. She said, it's legal. I said, it may be legal, but it's not moral. I said, I'm not going to do that. Oh, the language that came out of her mouth. I said, Kelly, we've been friends a long time. You don't need to talk to me like this. I said, I don't have to answer for your sin. I got enough of my own. But I said, I do have boundaries, and I'm not going to cross them. And you know what? I didn't have to be mean. I work with a guy who's got a son that's a transgender. The guy I work for is one of the finest men I know. He's honest. He's genuine. He's sincere, but he's not saved. The Sunday I delivered the message I preached this morning, my COVID message, when I delivered it at Hillcrest, he came and raised his hand. I've talked to him until I'm blue in the face. But he has a transgender son. I know his heart breaks. His son went to IU. He's now not Sam anymore, but he's Sammy. And there was a guy that came into the funeral home one day. He's a cousin of his. And oh, when he left. And I could hear the guy, what the guy was saying to him. And, and the guy was just using the Bible to beat, on, beat up on him about his son. It made him mad. He said to me when he left and I walked in, he said, that's one of you evangelicals. I said, now wait a minute. I said, I can't know what his motives were. But I said, you are going to have to take the right attitude with your boy. You've got to love your child unconditionally. But what they're doing is wrong. And it is wrong. I don't understand all that. I can't even comprehend. I can't even wrap my arms around it. But ladies and gentlemen, that's where we are in this country. And we need people to take a stand. But we don't need to be obnoxious and offensive. This can be offensive. The messenger should never be offensive. But when you take a stand based upon this book, you're going to be persecuted. Some way, somehow. I read a book not long ago entitled, She Said Yes. Did anybody ever read that book? It was written by Misty Bernal, the mother of Cassie Bernal. And in that book, she tells about how her daughter 
Casey became extremely rebellious in about the seventh, eighth, ninth grade and said we couldn't do anything with her. Said she turned our house into chaos. See, we fought it every step of the way. But we wondered, where is this going to go? Said in her junior year, she agreed to go to a retreat for teenagers sponsored by the church. And there, at that retreat, she gave her life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, most of the problems we have would be solved if people would just come to the place where they say, Lord, here I am. I surrender to you. I know I'm a sinner. Please take my life and use it. And said when she came home, she was a different person. Said for what we thought, we weren't sure what was going to happen. Her whole life changed. Her whole attitude changed. Her whole demeanor changed. On April 20th, 1997, she went to Littleton High School, or Col Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. And two young men, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebal, walked in with sh briefcases, satchels of homemade bombs and some guns. And before the end of the day, they had taken the lives of 11 students a faculty member and they committed suicide they took both their own life and they went into the library and, and she talks about there's some disagreement about who said this one of the young men that made it out confirmed that it was her daughter Casey Burnell that said it but there is some disagreement in her mind she knew her daughter she knew what her daughter was how rebellious she was what she was into and then when she gave her life to Christ her life changed and one of those two young men said to two girls under that table do you believe there's a God and Casey said I do and he put the gun to her head and pulled the trigger when you and I live a life that's godly and we live a life for Jesus Christ, one of the things we can expect is persecution. God help us to live for him. God help us to be a light in this dark world. You know what Jonathan was talking about? He was talking about taking some light and using the medium of sports into a very dark world and share in the light of Jesus. What a great idea. God help me to figure out how to reach others for him. Would you stand with me, please? Brian, would you come? Would you bow your heads? As we come tonight, maybe there's some areas in your life, like Paul, that you haven't come where you need to be. And maybe the Lord's spoken to you about some of those areas tonight. I mean, say, Pastor Brian, that's me. The Lord spoke to me about some areas that uh, I'm saved, but I need to be growing in my faith. I need to be uh, adding to my faith, obedience to the Lord in these areas. Would you just raise your hand so I could pray for you tonight? Many, many of us. You can put those down. Let's pray to the Lord together, and as we uh, pray, you talk to the Lord. Ask that He would use us as a church to share the gospel, that we would be uh, the encouragement we need to be to each other and the, the light we need to be this world. Lord, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for what you've done today and the, uh, the decisions that have been made, the hearts that have been spoken to, and the, the way that your word has gone out. And I, I pray that uh, we would allow your word to do the work you want it to in our hearts. And I pray even tonight as we, we come to you that our hearts would be tender, that we would surrender to you, and that you would use us as we leave from this place. We thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you grab a hymnal? Turn with me to hymn number 488. 488. We'll do a hymn of invitation. The altar is open if you need to do business with the Lord. Out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. i 
today and uh, thank you so much Pastor Holman it's what we needed today and I uh, appreciate you coming and being with us Chuck just where you are would you mind closing us in a word of prayer 